without further ado, we're going to actually jump into one of our first speakers for our discussion, Dr. Pygott, professor from OU, near and dear friend of me, uh, mentor as well. And yes, we're going to pull up that presentation from the file explorer, and I'm going to pass it off to Dr. P. Thank you, Cece. Our, our story really begins about 265 million years ago, just before the first COVID extinction. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I lie. Next slide. Um, we're going to talk to you about something very strange. In 1834, this man, John Scott Russell, an engineer, was um, going along in a wagon along a canal in uh, England. And he noticed that there was this uh, strange, strange wave that appeared in this channel. And he chased it. He chased it for a couple of miles before he lost it. But he, he was really struck by how bizarre this way was performing in the water. And he called it a soda tunnel. So, uh, it messes up. We seem to have oh, yeah, this slide. Um, well, these waves have at least four properties, these, these waves. Um, they're stable. They can travel over very large distances. And uh, they tend to, to tend to the speed depends upon the depth of the water. And unlike normal waves, they, they never merge. So a small wave can take over a, a larger one. If the wave is too big for the depth of water, it will make two. So a soliton. The strange thing is, this was against O. Newton and, and Bernoulli and, and, and other people. And he could not really figure out how this was, uh, how these form. Next slide, please. But Joseph Valentin Busanesque. Okay in 1871 says, I have an idea. He came up with the Busanesque equations and he actually decided to um, put, employ them to explain how solitons uh, work. Unfortunately, it was about 100 years before we could actually solve the Busanesque equations with a computer. Next slide, which led us into this strange phenomenon known as solitary waves. And here you can see some, um, the water is flowing from the south, from the southeast and northwest, if you will. And those are antidudes, and our above these antidudes are solitons. And this is the result in a particular bed form, too, which is known as the hum of the cross stratification status. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so that was the, the forward problem is to take something which you see in the modern and try to say something intelligently about what the hydrology was when the bed forms. Uh, fluid bed venture stress can predict bed forms. We know classically that uh, we have this, these stages that go all the way from uh, uh, ripples up to um, standing, uh, to climbing ripples, to, to uh, sand waves and dunes, and the plain beds. But then we're going to this really beautiful um, episode of standing waves, which when they break, they move in reverse. Well, these, these, um, this particular event form is really rather complicated, and the preservation is unusual. Okay? It's not rare, um, but it can be defined by something known as the Freud number. I'll speak about that a little later on, but a Freud number of one is really where the plane beds initiates, and above the Freud number of one, we obtain these antidotes. Next slide. Um, how many cross ramifications? These are problematic. They form, as I will say, in more than one, one way, but um, they're rarely preserved, but they are, they are incredibly um, unique when you see them, you know them. And what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight, um, except unless you're in Saudi Arabia this morning, so Sabai here at Cape Ahalak, um, we're going to be looking at Hamaki cross ramification beds, which are preserved in the uh, permit. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to take you to um, the Delaware Basin, to the Perkin, and uh, to an outcrop that's really quite famous. It's called the, uh, the Radar Slide. And you can see the location at the bottom right is uh, it's the road cut. And I'm going to take you to another place, which is a creek bed. Next slide, you can better see for those who are not familiar with the Perkin, not familiar with the Capitan Reef System, we're going to be looking at the radar, uh, which is uh, most of it's been chiseled or rolled away at the top. But uh, down at the road cut, next slide, we see some uh, enormous boulders, which are um, which are encased in this matrix. Next slide. And when we when we look at this, we see some of these boulders are the size of Volkswagens, and they are rounded, and they are composed of um, 
uh, of the brie. Um, some of it's uh, cemented, some of it's uh, been severely exposed, which has been transferred down this slide. But the really interesting thing is you see those blue arrows. I don't know if you can, but when you go to now, I don't know if you notice this, the outcrop changes with the direction of the sunlight. I don't know how many times I've been to this outcrop and did not see this. So I was on this field trip with WTGS a few years ago, and the sun was exactly right. And I could see there were two, maybe three episodes of hunting cross replication above these boulder beds. And that's where our puzzle begins. Next slide. Okay, now I, I, would, I must digress a bit and tell you that within these boulders, um, uh, it's, it's mega breccia from the uh, Guadalupe uh, reef up above, and uh, it is it's full of forams and, and some are cemented, and, and uh, there's even some some uh, oil. A few of these modules. Next slide. And I'm going to go fast because I've loaded everything here. And, and commonly, people say that when I when I speak, it's like and for the listeners, like drinking from a fire hydrant. So I'll try to. Um, Go a little faster. Next slide. This is just showing you we're in the Permian, yeah. in, and uh, we're in a, a low sea level time. And during low sea level, things are unstable. And stay right here for a minute. Uh, there's a big collision event between South America and North America, and um, it's, it's creating all kinds of tectonic stresses and seismic stresses. Which in the next slide, one can see from oh, I call these yo-yo tectonics. Uh, so a soft set of a deformation, which is very common when we have seismic activities. Now, the importance of the seismic activity, next slide, is that when we go around and look at the actual reef uh, in, in Guadalupe, we can see fractured sedge, which was cemented, and some at that time would have been open, would have, been, would have created zones of weakness. On the right is some subsurface work we're doing. You can see a, um, a settling gravity flow, which is detached. And, um, which is broken off. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to take you now into the uh, creek bed. So now in the creek bed, we're going to attack three sets, three individual sets um, of homogeneous cross replication, and they are above and below different units. Next slide. I'll show you. Um, they have arrows. Just one more time. One more time. Stop. So the blue arrows is this lower set. These are large, these are a couple of meters um, in, in wavelength. And then there's a smaller set in green here, and a smaller set in yellow. And then it goes back to um, horizontal lamination. Now beneath this are these big boulders. So what is this hunky cross notification? What is it? What is it telling us? Next slide. Well, um, they're composed of different things. Okay. Um, next slide. I'm going to show you this. The hundred plus application, one more slide, one more, one more slide. Okay. Um, we use the XRF together with uh, um, with the LIDAR to, to look at lithologies. And we find that there is tremendous changes in mud, carbonate, and uh, in quartz uh, between these, uh, between what's underlying the hummock heat and what's above the hummock. Next slide. One more. And uh, the, the middle radar you can see here um, has this blue dashed line, and that's the actual position of the hunting cross replication sets. It um, is, is composed of um, oh, the, the smaller amounts of stuff that are much more carbonate. Next slide. Okay. Point just here. Just going to skip that a few minutes. Just stay here. So it looks like if we try to summarize what we're seeing in outcrop. Also from photography, um, the reef fossils we see in the big boulder beds. Uh, it, it, be, it tends to be it appears to be indicative of a uh, paleo shelf margin. Of course, the XRF is actually showing us through. If I had the time to go through it, suboxic and oxic conditions. Uh, which CC is an expert on in the, in the lower and upper radar. There's, there's no evidence of bioturbation, and what's it's going to tell us is that something about our minimum water depth and something that. Uh, a cause of what, what is occurring. So it does appear to be a sudden drop in sea level uh, to make the Humpty cross replication beds. It had already fallen down. Next slide. Um, so Humpty cross replication, as I said, is, is problematic. There can be more than one uh, genesis of its origin. It can be indicative of, of storm deposits. That's really the first uh, the first idea thrown out there. Tempest is the word. 
Um, they can also be suggestive of turbinites uh, in, in some cases, in shallow water, but also they can be indicative of tsunamis. Next slide. Uh, I have one more slide, please. One more. One more. Stop it. Okay. One more. For the next thing. Yes. <laughs> um, we don't think they're shelf storm deposits because the water depth is too deep. We're at almost, we're, we're, we know that they're more than 250 meters. Okay. Would be the maximum water water to be. And we don't believe in turbidites because the wavelengths of the cross stratification of turbidites is much smaller than what we see in the alpha. Next slide. And so we're going to go back to the upper flow regime uh, connection between um, standing solitons, their humpy cross stratification vessels, which you preserve. We find that if it's a point number of about uh, 0.85, that means that we have a soliton. Next slide. So we're going to say that these are anti-germs. Next slide, please. Again, I'm just summarizing some things here. Um, and 0.84, see now it's all points here. Point number 0.84 will give you um, the anti-germ stage. Next slide. Okay. The uh, the domes are that the boulders are subrounded. They were a mega breccia, subaqueous slide. The depth of the paleo shelf, it, it's not less than 85 meters because of the anoxia. And because of our fossils, no evidence of bioturbation supports a suboxone and oxygen environment. XRF chemistry indicates that those conditions are consistent. And fossil composition shows something very interesting. The first wave, the first common cross stratification, that's our deep water. The second appears to be mixed deep water, shallow water. The third is offshore to onshore. So what does this mean? Next slide. Um, next slide. Jump to. Okay, this is a, this is one more slide. Oh, go back. My bad. My bad. So sorry. Mark, go back to Mark. Right there. Just stay right there. Thank you. I have an excellent operator here. I will not criticize at all. We believe that the slide initiates, such as A here, uh, sliding down on B, creates this um, this this uh, this mass uh, differential. The water is is uplifted there, and C. It rolls up on the, on the shore and he comes back. Okay? And this thing is recorded in the hum of the cross replication sites. Next slide. Uh, next slide. You know, one, two, seven to 10 minutes. Um, we're going to make so my co author is actually sitting in the audience, Travis Moore and I. We went to the University of Delaware and with some very powerful uh, computational uh, tsunami packages, uh, tried to. to uh, to model what could have possibly happened. So we're going to take the paleo bathymetry from isotaxy in the Delaware basin. We're going to craft a paleo fitness map, provide data for this called NH wave, and then generate a, another Kusinesque numerical problem models for the northwest east shelf slides. Next slide. Okay, so this is sort of the, the idea. We we know that we have these two positions. I don't know what over here. <laughs> two positions okay, of slides here and up here. From the isopat maps, they are radar. Okay. And uh, no, Charlie, parents, these are not contourites. But anyway, they originate in two or three different channels, creating a spread out deposit. And next slide um, at least 40 kilometers, cubic kilometers of transport sediments are coming into the shell. There are only one or two sources. We're going to model these. I'll show you what happens. Next slide. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, the, the um, geometry of the Delaware Basin. Um, and uh, you see the thickness of the Northwest, that's the radar slide. Well, on the east is the other radar slide. Next slide. And next slide, let's go back. Okay, this is our model, and it looks very simple. You can see the water flowing, and you see this, the uh, sediment on the bottom. And uh, this is 256 processors, two hours, 520 CPU hours, which is rather a lot of the three size. Next slide. But what I want to show you here is this this uh, mega tsunami waves, they're about 55 meters in height on shore, and ocean velocity is about 80, 80, so about 89 uh, meters per second. Okay. And you can see that some of them are bouncing and we're back to back. So we believe that this is causing our, our multiple sets of um of public cross rotation sets. Next slide. Um, so next slide. So there's run up. Um, 
And our point numbers agree uh, perfectly with our, what our bed form should be. We're having well, most of our point numbers, in fact, are, are really much, much higher than 0.85, uh, as you show around the perimeter here. Next slide. And um, this, this deposit, uh, you would rather catastrophic uh, tsunami. In fact, this would be called a today a mega tsunami. Um, and uh, next slide. Uh, we also have a tsunami from the east. Now, we do not know for certain if the third element of cost application set is from, is from this very first tsunami, or it could be that in response to the one on the other side. We know that at this point, there's an aggressive system track, sea level has fallen, the shelf is unstable, and there could be more than one collapse. This has happened several times in the Delaware Basin. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, I must say, I, um, I have to tell you something about the oil, excuse me, but um, what we find, next slide, is that um, there have to be um, this, this formal field that corresponds exactly to where the isopack of the tsunami deposit is, and it's called the two threads field. It has 15, you know, modest 15 million barrels of oil, and it matches our eastern debris slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so low sea level time during radar to fracture. Our hypothesis is that um, the bank was uh, was about stable. It slid into the water, created these tsunamis one, two, and three, which documents we believe uh, the initial runup wave, the backflow wave, and either a third wave from refraction or from the northeast slide. Next slide. So here's a, again the cartoon of what I showed earlier. And the idea of how you can see stacked in D, the um, the, the tsunami will produce the excuse me, the Helmuthi cross thread of the first Next slide. Next slide. And so thank you. And next slide. Are there any questions? 